bless you. You can be seated. Well, we're already having a good time, aren't we? A special hello to people who are in the overflow room, but I always tell people, in here we get the Holy Spirit, but you get the Holy Spirit and the overflow. Over there. Are any of your other churches hooked in? So we're just here tonight, so that's good. Anyway, uh, you know me, and I wish I knew all of you, but I don't. However, I'll just give you a little quick update. Dave and I have been married 57 years. And, uh, I've had the great privilege of teaching God's Word for 48 years. And um, all right, we have four grown children. Our two boys are now running the day-to-day -day business of the ministry, and I basically preach and teach and write and pray and do my television, which keeps me busy. We have 12 grandchildren, and we have six great-grandchildren and a set of twins that are in the cooker right now, so we have, so we're gonna have two sets of twins in our family. And I said, all I do all year is write checks. <laughs> I just write checks. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that as I share the word tonight, that lives will be changed and souls will be saved and people will make decisions. Decisions for Christ first and foremost, but decisions about things they've been putting off, decisions about obeying you in areas where they know they've heard from you and they've just been putting it off. This is a night of decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I wanna to talk to you tonight about the deception of procrastination. <laughs> I knew that I was gonna get that. <sighs> You know why procrastination is a deception? Because it tells you I'm not in disobedience because I'm going to obey God. But God spoke to my heart a few years ago and he said, good intentions are not obedience. See, so we think, well, I know what God told me and I'm going to do it but unless he's told you to wait till another time, then now is always God's time. Now, one of the things you'll learn tonight is if you don't move when God says to move, then you're likely to end up having to move without the anointing. Because when God says to do something, there's an anointing on it. See, this is the message I was supposed to speak tonight, so there's an anointing on it. Now, if I decided I was gonna do something else, it probably wouldn't be as anointed. I think, well, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll wait and teach that the next time I come. It wouldn't, wouldn't be as anointed as it will be tonight. You need to understand that. When God puts something in your heart, it's much easier for you to do it when he tells you to do it because his anointing and his grace is there to help you do it. If you put it off to your timing, See, God's timing is equivalent to his will. So if we wanna be in God's will, we have to also be in his timing. So first, let me say, if you've been putting off receiving Christ into your life, if you've been putting off even a full surrender, you know, we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and if you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. But I like to put it another way, does the Holy Spirit have you? See, I tend to think that's maybe more the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Because you don't like just get the Holy Spirit for the first time. You receive the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one. But when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1976, I had just kind of come to the end of myself. I had tried so hard to be a good Christian. And do you know that People say living the Christian life is hard. Well, it's not hard, it's impossible. 
You can't do it unless God's doing it through you. You can't do it. And you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. And the only way that you can be full of the Holy Spirit is if you give all of yourself to Him. And see, what we tend to do is give Him sections. I always say we want enough of Jesus to stay out of hell, but not enough. <laughs> so I'm just encouraging you. I know from doing this a lifetime that the areas that you think you're gonna close off to God, you're just hurting yourself. So how about opening any doors that you've had sealed shut? Even, even doorways that you know when you open them, it's gonna cause some pain. You know, I could not get healed from the sexual abuse from my father in my childhood until I let God into that area of my life. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to talk about it. It wasn't easy to tell the world about it. But I found healing through that. And sometimes when you wait, when you procrastinate, you miss an opportunity. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. Galatians 6.10. First of all, verse nine says, Now I forgot what it says. <laughs> oh, be not weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if you faint not. And then verse 10 says that we should be mindful to be a blessing, especially to the household of God, and take every opportunity. You see, when, when the offering was received tonight, it wasn't somebody trying to get your money. It was an opportunity for you to reach out beyond yourself and do something for somebody else. We have to get over this mentality that the church is trying to take something away from you all the time. Everywhere you go, they talk to you about money. Church is the only place where it bothers us. You go get something to eat when you leave here, they're gonna ask you for money. You stop and get some gas, they're gonna ask you for money. You go to the grocery store tomorrow, they're gonna ask you for money. For the life of me, I don't know why we get bothered when the church says we need money. Everybody, I love your television program. Oh my goodness, if everybody who loves it would just send in an offering occasionally, see? We love free stuff, but you know, do you know that free is not actually good for you? <clears throat> it's really not. Paul, in one place in the Bible, he said, I did you a disservice because I didn't receive offerings from you. I worked and took care of myself. And he said, I actually did you a disservice. See, there's no relationship if one person does all the taking and the other person does all the giving. Relationship only comes through give and take. So don't, don't let opportunities pass you by. And then Ephesians 5.16 says that we should also take advantage of every opportunity that we have that comes our way. It's just talking about living your life. And when you're out living your life and you have an opportunity to talk to someone, to encourage someone, to bless someone, you know, you have a ministry. And very few ministries are up here. Most ministries are out there. And they're where you work and where you live and where you go to school. And if the world is gonna be saved, it's gonna take you. It's not gonna happen through a handful of people. And our job is to train you up that you should go out and do the work of the ministry. That's the five-fold ministry. We're not supposed to just do all the work. We're supposed to teach you how to get out and do the work. And so procrastination is really deceptive. And now, you know, I usually have more in any given day to do than what I can do. And so there's always things that I have to put off until the next day. But I'm not procrastinating. It it's things that I can take care of the next day. And then at the end of that day, there's things for the next day. But when God tells me to do something, 
I've learned the hard way that I don't want to put it off. First of all, he'll be very gen- he'll be very good to you in the beginning and he'll nag you until you obey him. Sometimes God will put on my heart to give somebody something to man. If I don't, I'll just keep hearing it and keep hearing it, keep hearing it. And in the beginning of learning how to hear from God, that was one of the ways that I learned how to hear from God was I knew that if he just kept it up, it just kept coming back and kept coming back. You know, I, a couple months ago, I, I had a girl on my heart that I hadn't seen for years. And she just kept standing on my heart, kept standing on my heart. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna call her. So I called her and she said, oh, I'm so glad you called. She said, I fell, I'm in the emergency room and I broke both of my wrists. And so it was just a good time for her to have some encouragement. So don't miss opportunities when God gives them to you. Because you know what? God will find somebody to do what he wants done. If he has to go through a thousand people, he'll find somebody that will do what he wants them to do. But when he gives you the opportunity, you don't want to let it pass you by. Okay. In Exodus... Pharaoh was not obeying God to let the people go. It was time for Moses to lead the people out. They'd been in bondage for many years, over 400 years, and God heard their cries and he sent Moses to lead them out. And Pharaoh was not obeying him, so God sent 10 plagues on Egypt. And one of those was a plague of frogs. Now, if you're a frog lover, I don't mean to offend you, (laughs) but I personally am not crazy about them. First of all, they're, I guess they're slimy. They look slimy and they croak and I don't like croakers and they jump and you never know which way they're going to jump. And I don't like that either because I kind of like to know what's going to happen. And so... I don't, I don't do frogs. And um, the Lord sent a plague of frogs on the land of Egypt. And beginning in chapter eight, verse one, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go that they may worship me. And if you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace. Now, now just, I want you to try to imagine what this would be like. (laughs) They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed and into the houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and your kneading troughs. (laughs) The frogs will come up on you and your people and on all your officials. Now, just imagine if you went home tonight, you drove in the garage and you heard crunch, 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 crunch. And when you opened your car door, three frogs jumped on you. And then you got out of the car and five more frogs jumped on you. You're trying to throw them off and you got over to your door and you opened the door to your house and there's more frogs. And you went to the bathroom and there's frogs in the toilet and there's frogs everywhere. So you think, I'm just gonna go to bed and you get in bed and there's frogs in the bed. Now, you know, Pharaoh wasn't real smart. (laughs) Then the Lord said to Moses, verse five, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and the canals and the ponds and make the frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came and covered the land. But the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. Now, you know, I say that Pharaoh wasn't very smart because if he's already got a land full of frogs, why would he have his magicians make more frogs? <laughs> no. So they got more frogs. And verse nine, Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs. So he said, I'll tell you what, 
When I pray, the frogs are gonna go, but I'm gonna give you the honor of setting the time. Well, I would have said now, <laughs> right now. But Pharaoh said tomorrow. <laughs> now who in their right mind would wanna sleep with frogs one more night <laughs> if they could get out of it? Hmm. tomorrow. What are you putting off? Forgiving someone that you're angry at? Confronting somebody who's taking advantage of you and you just keep letting them do it? A job that needs to be done? The closet, the garage, the basement, the whatever it might be. Losing weight, gaining weight, getting out of debt. Hmm. Apologizing to someone, you know you hurt their feelings and you just keep putting it off. I'll do it tomorrow. Going to the dentist. <clears throat> Going to the doctor to see about that pain you've had for two years, but you just keep putting it off because you really kind of don't want to find out what it is. Starting a regular exercise program and sticking with it. <laughs> Setting a regular time for prayer and Bible study. Setting aside a generous amount of money that you give to the work of the kingdom Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, he who observes the wind and waits for all conditions to be favorable will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. I love that scripture in the Amplified Bible. If you wait for every condition to be favorable, you'll never get around to sowing in any area of your life. And I'm not just talking about money. You know, every act of obedience is a seed that we sow. And so, why do we put it off? We think, I don't know, we think the problem will disappear overnight. You think, you know, if you're deep in debt and you just keep putting more and more things on credit, do you think it's just gonna disappear maybe if you just ignore it long enough? You know, when we ignore things long enough and they get so big that they come crashing down on our heads. Uh, 30, Eight years ago, I went for a mammogram and found out that I had breast cancer. And um, I mean, and th this is just a good lesson. The doctor told me, he said, it's a good thing you came in when you were supposed to. He said, this tumor was very tiny and the radiologist did a great job in reading it accurately, but he said it was a very fast growing type of cancer and if you would have put it off, you might have ended up dying. It's just not wise to put things off. So I'm just asking you tonight, if you're sitting here, or you're watching this by television, you're in the overflow rooms, if there's something that you know that God has put on your heart, and you're putting it off. It's not gonna get easier tomorrow. <laughs> it's not gonna get easier next week. It's not gonna get easier next year. Matter of fact, I think the longer you put it off, the harder it gets because when we keep putting things off, they nag at us, don't they? It's kind of like having a spiritual hangnail. <laughs> Have you ever had a hangnail on your toe and it keeps getting caught in the covers? at night, I hate that. It's like, I'll finally have to get up and just try to take care of it. It's time to start doing things God's way. Now, maybe I should just ask for the fun of it, how many of you are putting something off? Right, don't give me one of these. 
And how many of you are lying and you have your hand down and it should be up? <laughs> you know, let's go back to this confronting thing. Don't let people control you and take advantage of you. Confront them in love, but confront them and tell them, God didn't create me to be manipulated and controlled and I'm not gonna let you do that anymore. And of course, they're gonna threaten you and you're gonna say, well, if the only way I can be in relationship with you is if you control me, then I guess we won't be in relationship. Amen. And I know there's a whole bunch of people here that need to forgive somebody because I've never been in any church where it's been any different. And I will tell you from me personally, and I have learned this over the years, and I believe this with all my heart, holding unforgiveness is one of the absolute worst things that you can do spiritually. It shuts down your prayer life. It hurts you in every single way that you can be hurt spiritually. It hurts your fellowship with God. It doesn't fix your enemy. It doesn't heal you. It does no good at all. All it does is poison your spirit and hurt you. Now, faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 is an interesting scripture to me. Now this only, this is in every translation except two. And it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That's the NIV. Do you ever wonder why the word now is first? I got to wondering about that and I, th I thought, you know, you don't need that for the sentence. You can just start out faith as the, the confidence and what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. But every translation starts out now. And I, th I think it's because faith has to be now. I, I, I can't wait till tomorrow to have faith for today. I can only have faith, now I can have faith today that tomorrow is gonna work out good or I can even have faith today that God's gonna help me with something that I've made a mistake in in the past, but I can only have faith is always right now. It's now. Did you ever wonder about that, why the word now is there? I just, I just think that it has to be that, it can't be anything else because it's not, it almost like makes the sentence not make any sense if that's not what it's there for. Now faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the proof of things that we do not see. And now this is only in the Amplified Bible, but I like it well enough to read it. In Hebrews chapter four, verses one and seven, Paul is talking to them about entering the rest of God. Does anybody know how wonderful it is to be in the rest of God? Oh my gosh. I worried and fretted and reasoned and carried on for so many years and wondered about what people thought of me when I preached and you know, all these different things. And it's part of your journey with God, but eventually you're either gonna to learn to enter the rest of God or you're gonna go crazy because you can only take so much of that stress and pressure of trying to take care of everything yourself. And so Paul talks a lot about entering the rest of God and we enter the rest of God through believing. When you put your faith in God, you cast your care on him and you believe that he will take care of the problem. Now that also includes doing whatever he might tell you to do. See, I'm a firm believer that we're partners with God. We have a part and he has a part. And in Ephesians 6, there's a little verse that says, having done all the crisis demands, you are to now stand firmly in your place. But first you do what you do, what you can do, you do what the crisis demands. You know, I, I, I can't pray for God to clean my house. I can't pray for groceries just to show up in my house. I can pray for God to give me the money for them. I can pray for God to give me the grace to 
go get them, the energy to go get them, but I've got to do the part that I've got to do. And a lot of people don't realize that. They want God to do what they should be doing and they try to do what only God can do. So we get it backwards. And there are things in your life that you can't fix and you can't do anything about. And those things are the things that you need to cast your care about and put them totally on God. And then you can enter the rest of God. But here's what Paul says in Hebrews 4.1. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still holds and is offered today, let us be afraid to distrust it, lest any of you should think he has come too late and has come short of reaching it. And then in verse seven, he says, again, he sets a definite day, a new today, and gives another opportunity of securing that rest, saying through David after so long a time, in the words already quoted, today, if you would hear his voice, and when you hear it, do not harden your hearts. Today. Today is the day for you to make a decision. Today is the day that you're gonna make a decision to get more serious with God than you ever have before. Can I tell you something? Just coming to church and sitting here week after week after week won't get you to heaven. Now we're only saved by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. But anybody who has real faith, I mean truly, if, you are, if you're truly born again, then you can't help but change. First John 1, 1 John 3, 9, I think it is, says that. It says that when we're born again, we receive the seed of Christ and we cannot stay the same because literally Christ is living in us. And so the minute that you're born again, have any of you ever noticed that when you're born again, there's a new war that starts that you never knew was there before? All the things that now bug you that didn't, didn't bother you at all before. Well, that's the Holy Spirit dealing with you, but he's doing it for your good. And the quicker you obey him, the better your life is gonna be. I mean, what, you know, really, what, what does anybody want other than to have righteousness, peace, and joy? And Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not about stuff. This is not about getting God to give you your wish list, but it's righteousness, having a right relationship with God. And we get that through our faith in Christ. We become right with God when we receive Jesus as our savior. That's the most wonderful thing in the world. And then peace and then joy. That's what the kingdom is. And so, you know, years and years ago when I had all these 50 things on my prayer list that I was asking God to give me, stupid stuff that I didn't no more need than, you know, anything. A fur coat and this and that, and, you know. <laughs> that was back when fur coats were popular. They're not now, but I thought, oh man, I, God, give me a fur coat. I didn't know how, I didn't know what pitiful condition I was in. And one time God challenged me. He said, compare your, compare your prayers with the apostle Paul. So I got out all of Paul's prayers. And do you know Paul never prayed one time for any material thing, not for himself, nor for the church. He never prayed one time for any of their problems to go away. What he prayed was that they would be able to endure whatever came with good temper. Hmm. What if you came for me for prayer and said, I have this problem, Joyce, and I want you to pray for me. And I started praying, oh God, please help them endure this problem and, and stay patient and happy. You're like, I don't want that prayer. I want you to pray the problem will go away. <laughs> you see how we are? Do you know that Well, I'll go ahead and say it. You may not like it, but. <laughs> you know, the, the pain of the things that we go through actually are some of the best things in the world for us.
And I read one time, and it's absolutely true, the things that you think right now are your greatest enemy, someday you'll realize it was your biggest friend because that was what made you change. And that pain that you feel inside when God is changing you, don't fight it, enter the, enter the rest of God about it. It's like when a woman is given birth, what, what do they say? Breathe, <laughs> relax, push. <laughs> Make you think, push, I feel like my guts are coming out. <laughs> I love when couples now, men say, we're pregnant. <laughs> we're having a baby. No, you ain't having a baby. <laughs> you're gonna get a baby, but you're not having the baby. I, I heard something cute today, if I can get it right. This is really just something I want to say to the men. So men, this is important, so you, I want you to get this. This is something special for you and it'll really help you in your life. When you, when you get married, you enter a relationship. And in relationships, there's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of ideas going back and forth and there's a lot, lot of opinions. And only one person can be right and that other person is called the husband. I knew I married Mr. Wright, I just didn't know his first name was always. Now you'll try to remember that to go tell it to somebody else, won't you? <laughs> Today, I believe there's an anointing here tonight for you to make decisions. I, I don't want you just to, oh, Joyce preached a good sermon and then tomorrow somebody say, what did Joyce preach on? Um, um. No, you tell them, the deception of procrastination. She taught on the deception of procrastination and how dangerous it is, especially to put off things that God tells you to do or things he tells you to stop doing. I mean, all the other stuff, you know, if you don't clean your closet out, that's up to you. If it bu bugs you, then you know, you, then you just need to do it and get it over with. But the big things I'm talking about are the things that God speaks to your heart and shows you to do or tells you not to do. Those are the things that you need to, I mean, lock into, get committed to, and no matter how bad it hurts, you need to do them. Somebody say amen. amen. Well, you know what we do, you know why we don't do it? We make excuses and we blame other people. We make excuses for our frogs. And we blame our frogs on somebody else. Matter of fact, we get comfortable with the frogs. They've been around so long, we don't even smell them anymore. They, every once in a while, the stink gets too bad, we'll spray a little room deodorizer on it, but you know, <laughs> getting rid of them is a different thing. Maybe you invited the frog. I don't know. You could be going home to sleep with the frog tonight. Now, I've, if, it, if it's your husband, I'm not calling him a frog, but <laughs> it's kind of a sneaky way to say if you're well, with somebody you're not married to, then I hope he croaks tonight and you say it's time to go. <laughs> I don't mean croaks like dies, but you know, I wish I could make a good frog sound, but I probably can't. Don't let somebody take advantage of you like that. You know, sometimes we have, we, we do, we have stupid stuff around and we just get so used to it, we don't even realize we've got it anymore. Or we have 
behaviors in our life that are so obnoxious, but we just, we just get so accustomed to behaving that way, and then somebody's not confronting us, they're just putting up with it. You know, I had a relationship one time with somebody that I worked for, and, and he really was a controller. And I didn't want to lose my position, and so I came under that spirit, and I was still hurting from all the stuff with my dad, who was also a manipulator and a controller. And a few years went by, and I realized I was being controlled, and I, I really got mad at him. And you know what God said to me? He said, it's just as much your fault as it is his because you let him do it. Amen. See, we like to blame everything on everybody else, but there's always a responsibility on both sides. There's always two sides to everything. In John chapter five, we see a man that had been laying by a pool for 38 years waiting for a miracle. Once a year, an angel came and stirred up this pool of water. It was called the Pool of Bethesda. And whoever got in first got healed. One person out of all the people laying around that pool got healed. And so when Jesus came there, there was a lot of sick people laying around. And verse five says, there was a certain man there that had suffered with a deep-seated and a lingering disorder for 38 years. Now, we don't know what his disorder was, but apparently he couldn't get around with any ease because he'd been laying there for 38 years. And verse six says, when Jesus noticed him lying there helpless, and we know how compassionate Jesus was, so you gotta get the meat out of this. Jesus saw him helpless, knowing that he had been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to become well, question mark, are you really in earnest about getting well? <laughs> and I would like to say to you tonight, I doubt that there's anybody in here that had a bigger mess in their life than I did when I started trying to walk with God. I'd been sexually abused for about 15 years by my dad. I was 18 years old. I thought when I got away from home, got away from him, I got away from the problem. I didn't realize I took the problem with me in my soul. Yeah. So you can get away from something, but if you've still got the results of all of it in you, then that's the part that has to be healed and only God can do that. Only he can get inside you and heal those kind of hurts that you don't even know how to talk about. And I want you to know tonight and believe me that if you will stop putting things off and you will begin to not just go to church and believe your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that Jesus is coming again, but if you will start to really walk with the Holy Spirit and be led and guided by the Holy Spirit, listen to what he says. Spend time in prayer. Don't make your own plans. Don't plan and then pray that God will make your plans work. Pray and then plan after God leads you and guides you. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Part of the great Lord's prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. We need to all be concerned more about the kingdom of God than ourselves individually. And there's not enough concern corporately about the kingdom. There's a world out there that's going to hell. Yes. And we need to be busy turning on the lights. Any person, no matter what kind of mess your life is in, if you'll begin to do things God's way, it'll take time. It's not gonna happen overnight. It'll probably take longer than you'd like it to but God will heal your life and he'll heal your soul and he'll heal your mind and your emotions and you can be peaceful and joyful and you know, you can just, what does anybody want other than to be happy? I mean, it's, 
it's not really a big house that you want or a new car or a promotion at work. You want to be happy. You want to believe that you've got a right relationship with God, that he loves you. God loves you. And so this man had been laying there and he said, do you really want to get well? And so I guess I'll just throw that out tonight. Do you really want to get well? And if you do and you're serious about it, then I promise you that if you will follow God and do things his way, the day will come when you'll be able to say, God has taken it all and turned it out for my good. Amen. Amen. Well, now here's the interesting part in verse seven, the invalid said, sir, here comes the excuses. I have nobody when the water's moving to put me into the pool, but while I'm trying to come into it myself, somebody else always gets ahead of me. So what's he saying? I've been laying here 38 years and nobody has ever come and put me into the pool. And even if I try, somebody always gets ahead of me. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm a little aggressive. And in 38, in 38 years, I could have wiggled. I mean, 38 years times 365 days, that's a lot of time to wiggle. I could have wiggled and squiggled my way over and I would have been laying on the very edge of that pool and I mean the first bubble I would have fallen in. <laughs> but see, he was just laying there waiting for somebody to do it for him and feeling sorry for himself because of his condition. That's why Jesus said, do you really want to get well? Are you serious about getting well? Now, let, now let's look at another man who had a completely different spirit. A little man named Zacchaeus. Luke 19, the first six verses. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through and a man was there <clears throat> by the name of Zacchaeus and he was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. Now, tax collectors were the most hated of all. And he was wealthy because he'd been stealing the people's money. The way the tax collectors worked was the Roman government required a certain amount of tax, but then they were free to add on to that whatever they wanted to. So that's why the people, even though they were Jews, the Jews hated them because they were stealing their money. So he was a tax collector and he had gotten wealthy off of the backs of taking advantage of other people. So. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So let's just say that he had a disadvantage. I don't know how short he was. Let's say he was 4'10", who knows. <laughs> but he couldn't, see, he couldn't see, he wanted to see Jesus. <laughs> I want to see Jesus. And he couldn't see over the crowd. So he went and he climbed a tree. Now, you know, a lot of people wouldn't have bothered they would have just said, oh man, I'm short. Been short all my life. I've missed so many things because I've been short. If I was just a tall man, then I could see Jesus. <laughs> and just as Jesus walked under that tree, the Bible says he looked up and he saw Zacchaeus and he said, come down here. I'm going to your house today. Now, why did Je Zacchaeus didn't call for Jesus? He was just sitting in the tree watching him. But when Jesus got there, I think Jesus' spirit felt something that he liked. I think he felt some real determination and some, I'm not going to get left out. And can you imagine how mad it made all the Pharisees when Jesus went to that tax collector's house and had dinner with him? Are you gonna be the kind of person that sleeps one more night with the frogs, that lays by the pool 38 years, or are you gonna climb a tree? <laughs> Amen? What's going to be your choice? Are you in a pit 
and you don't know how to dig your way out, let me end with a little story. There was a farmer who had a donkey that fell into a well. And the animal cried, pitiful were his cries. For hours, the farmer tried to figure out, how am I gonna get this donkey out of this well? And he finally decided, well, he's old and I just don't think it's worth it, so I'm gonna call some of my neighbors and we're just gonna shovel dirt in there and cover him up and just suffocate him and let him die. So he called over his neighbors and they were shoveling dirt in there and he was crying, pitiful cries, and then pretty soon he got quiet and they wondered why. They kept shoveling dirt for a little bit and didn't hear anything from him, so they went and looked down in there and lo and behold, every time they'd throw in a shovel of dirt, he'd shake it off and get on top of it. <laughs> and they threw so much dirt on him that the dirt got up to the top of the well and he just got out there and walked off. <laughs> So you got a choice, you can shake your dirt off, actually let it become a benefit to you to help you get to where you wanna be, or you can just stay in the well and keep crying, mad at everybody else because nobody's coming along and doing it for you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that people here tonight who have not received you would make a decision that this is their night to do so. And that people who have not really fully surrendered would do that and you would fill them as they open up all the rooms in their life that you would fill them with the power of your Holy Spirit. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need you. And I pray that people would make decisions about things that they know you have spoken to them and they have not done and that they would start obeying you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Todd. Thank you.